Thank you, Peter and uh, PK, for the opportunity to come uptown and give my uh, talk. My charge this afternoon was to discuss the management of popliteal aneurysms. I'm going to somewhat focus on endovascular versus open repair. Popliteal artery aneurysms do have a male predominance. They are the most common peripheral artery aneurysm, and 30 to 50 percent of these patients have an associated abdominal aortic aneurysm. While popliteal artery aneurysms rarely rupture, they do cause acute and chronic ischemia secondary to embolization and thrombosis, as is seen by the photo on the right. In order to understand why we treat popliteal artery aneurysms, you do have to understand the natural history. Looking at a paper by Dawson years ago, he looked at 25 observed popliteal artery aneurysms. 57% of the asymptomatic and 50% of the symptomatic patients had complications, and when he uh, looked out to five years, 74% of those had complications. Zalaji noted that only 32% of non-treated popliteal artery aneurysms remained without lower extremity complications at five years. So in general, we treat popliteal artery aneurysms that are greater than two centimeters as they carry a 30 to 40% risk of ischemia, and with that is a high rate of limb loss. We also treat all symptomatic patients. However, the decision and technique for repair must be individualized depending upon the patient's many comorbidities, their anatomy, and the degree of lower extremity ischemia. Almost all patients that are considered for repair get imaging. We usually get a CTA or an MRA, and it almost always goes from the abdomen to the feet, and that's to look for the extent of disease like an abdominal aortic aneurysm. We need to know the anatomy, size, tortuosity of vessels, and the extent of thrombus. We also need to know the runoff vessels, which sometimes an angiogram is needed in order to see that. Patients with popliteal artery aneurysms that come in with acute threatening ischemia have three to four times the mortality rate and much higher rates of limb loss. Those patients go uh, get immediately heparinized. If they have time, they get a quick CAT scan and go to an operating room, uh, ideally a hybrid operating room. After an angiogram, they may get a combination of lysis and or open thrombectomy, and then depending upon their anatomy, they get open or endovascular treatment. The asymptomatic, or patients with uh, stable chronic ischemia, have time for a medical and cardiac assessment. They still get their imaging, and then based on all the information, you decide on open versus endovascular, or sometimes we do observe these patients. Open repair of popliteal artery aneurysms does require general anesthesia. There are two approaches which I will go over, the, posterior, the posterior approach and medial approach. With the posterior approach, the patient is supine. It is good for relieving compressive symptoms on the nerve or vein. However, you're limited in your proximal and distal dissection. It is extremely difficult to harvest the great saphenous vein, and you'll see why we want to harvest vein in a few slides. Uh, but if you look on the lower part of the slide, the saphenous vein is very close, and it, if it is of adequate caliber, you can harvest and use the small saphenous vein. One major advantage of this um, approach is that you can debulk and you can ligate collateral vessels to prevent retrograde uh, type leaks as there have been some reported growth and rupture. Here's operative pictures. On the left you have your lazy S incision for the posterior approach. Uh, the middle is the exposure of the popliteal artery and on the right you see the saphenous vein bypass uh, here. The medial approach, which uh, is much more common, is easier to harvest the great saphenous vein. You can extend proximally and distally, and sometimes you have to go down to the tibial vessels. Um, however, pop the popliteal aneurysm is excluded. It's not opened, and the back-flowing collateral vessels are not ligated. So the popliteal aneurysm can grow and rupture, as has been reported. This is just a larger picture of the medial approach. Uh, with the ligation and the bypass going around the popliteal aneurysm. As far as patency for open repairs, the five-year patency for all comers is between 60 and 75 percent. However, what I want to draw your attention to is if you look at the vein patency rates versus the PTFE patency rates, vein patency rates are 80 and 90 for primary and secondary compared to 50 to 63 uh, for PTFE. So we do try to get vein if it is available. And a vascular treatment of popliteal artery aneurysms has arisen as an alternative to open repair. It can be done under local anesthesia, which is an advantage, especially in the sick uh, patients. However, it should be uh, known that it is still an off-label use, and there is no billing code for stent grafting of a popliteal artery aneurysm. 
Uh, Mount Sinai's own uh, Mike Marin, along with Dr. Frank Veith in 1994, reported the first endovascular palpatillatory aneurysm repair with a homemade graft. Uh, the middle you can see after the graft is implanted, and they were balloon explandable stents, which you can see here on a PTFE graft. And on the right, you see the duplex at three months showing good exclusion of the palpatillatory aneurysm with flow through the graft in red. I'll share with you our study uh, published in JVS on endovascular pair of palpatillatory aneurysms. It was a retrospective review of 26 palpatillatory aneurysms. Mean size was just under three centimeters. Uh, we were pretty strict in our anatomic criteria, which I think is extremely important for the success of popliteal artery aneurysm repair. Uh, patients had to have two centimeter landing zones uh, with minimal proximal and distal size discrepancy and lack of extensive vessel tortuosity. Any patients that were gardeners or carpenters that routinely bent their leg greater than 90 degrees, we excluded from a uh, percutaneous approach. And patients that could not take antiplatelet medication were also excluded. Technical success was 96%, length of stay was a little over two days, follow-up was almost two years, and all patients took aspirin or Plavix. This is just an intraoperative angiogram, I'll quickly go through uh, the sizing, placement of the stent graft, uh, ballooning of the stent graft, and the completion angiogram. More importantly, I want to show on every popliteal uh, endovascular repair, we always do an angiogram with the knee bent, uh, because you can get kinking here, and if the stent graft ends right where the uh, popliteal artery bends, which is always a few centimeters above the knee joint, uh, you can get occlusions. Uh, our unpublished data, uh, I'm sorry, our outcomes uh, still in the, in the paper, primary patency was 91 and 86 percent at one and two years, secondary patency was 91 percent at one and two years, there were no episodes of limb loss. There were three occlusions, all fixed, one with a bypass, two with thrombectomy, the important thing is all occlusions had uh, single vessel runoff, and single vessel runoff was the only statistically significant predictor of failure of the stent grafts. Here is our unpublished data of uh, being written at present, endovascular versus open repair. There were 79 popliteal aneurysms, 36 open, 43 endovascular. The five-year Kaplan-Meier patency was a little bit lower for open repair, but it was not st statistically significant. However, secondary patency was 90% for both groups. Length of stay, as you would uh, expect, was shorter for the endovascular group. There was one amputation in the operative group. And like our prior paper, single vessel runoff predicted uh, occlusion rates for the endovascular approach. Looking at other uh, papers out there, Mohan looked at 30 popliteal artery aneurysm repairs, the three-year primary and secondary patency. They recorded 75 and 83 percent, which is similar to open surgery. Tilio looked at 73 popliteal artery aneurysm repairs, and five-year primary and secondary patency was 70 and 76 percent. Primary patency increased to 80 percent with interventionalist experience and the addition of Plavix. Uh, Antonello had one of the only prospectivized, uh, prospective randomized trial of 30 popliteal artery aneurysms. He showed no difference in limb salvage and patency at four years and showed decreased operative time and length of stay with the endovascular approach. And Lovegrove looked at a fairly large meta-analysis of open versus endovascular pair and showed no difference in long-term patency. Like the others, decreasing operative time and length of stay for the endovascular approach. Interestingly, he did find that the endovascular approach was more likely to have thrombosis and reintervention within 30 days. A quick look at multi layered stents for uh, endovascular repair of popliteal artery aneurysms. Thacker published only six uh, cases, 50% uh, occlusion rate at six months. And Antonou uh, published another six popliteal artery aneurysms with a 33% occlusion at uh, nine months. So, multi layered stents does not seem to be the answer. So in conclusion, I do think the decision timing technique on how to perform open or endovascular repair for popliteal artery aneurysms should be individualized to the patient. Endovascular repair of popliteal artery aneurysms is relatively safe with patency and limb salvage rates comparable to open repair in patients that have appropriate anatomy, and I think that's a very important, that have appropriate anatomy. And endovascular repair uh, does have decreased length of stay and procedure time. However, based on our own data, I do caution performing endovascular uh, repair in patients that have poor or single vessel runoff. 
Plavix may increase the patency rates, and uh, even though all this data is out there, we still await FDA approval for the actual procedure of endovascular repair, and I thank you for your attention.